am a hairstylist from Karachi, Pakistan. I knew I wanted to become a hairstylist at the age of seven. You see, I would sit behind my mother at 8 p.m. every night as she watched Murder, She Wrote on television. She had beautiful, luscious, thick hair, and I would braid it and enjoy myself. And as the days went on and my braids went to French braids and ponytails, I realized that that was what I wanted to do. I wanted to spend my days working on women's hair and making beautiful hairstyles and making them feel beautiful as a result. I don't really know how my mom felt about it, but I must tell you, she really did encourage me. The problem was, was that I grew up in Pakistan in the 80s, which was a fairly conservative society. Women from respectable families were not expected to go into the field of hairdressing, which everyone called beauty parlors at the time. It wasn't considered a profession for women. Instead, they should have been doctors or teachers. That was something that was acceptable. I didn't know how to work on my father to let him allow me to do what I wanted to do. So I went on the sly and I worked as an assistant and I worked as an apprentice and I worked with some wonderful women. The most notable is a woman called Nina Lotia, who's a very famous hairstylist in Pakistan. And she was my mentor and she taught me everything I wanted to know. An interesting thing happened though, while I was working as an assistant, I noticed that every time I had a woman in my chair, she automatically became extremely vulnerable. It didn't matter how rich she was or how powerful she was or how large in stature she was. The minute she sat in my chair, she dropped the facade and she became vulnerable, like a child. And it was up to me, just a teenager at the time, to help her solve all of these magnanimous problems. This put me in a real predicament. I didn't know what I should do. You know, it's very dangerous giving somebody marriage advice or relationship advice when you've never even had a real relationship yourself. This idea really stuck with me and I wanted to be responsible. It is a great responsibility giving people advice. So I went on to university to study psychology. I thought at least if I'm working with somebody and they're telling me a problem, I should at least have the skill set to know how to listen, even if I'm not counseling them. I really enjoyed my degree and I, I really enjoyed what I did. When I came back to Pakistan, I soon established my own salon very, very soon, even though I was only in my 20s. It was a wonderful experience. Success came very fast and I was very fortunate. I developed an amazing clientele. I had a wonderful salon. I worked with some of the best companies that Pakistan had in terms of hair color. But I felt empty inside. I felt that I had achieved so much and I had done everything in accordance with my art. But there was something missing. There was an emptiness and I didn't know how to fulfill it. You see, I always wanted to do something to help people, to change people. As a hairdresser, I help women see how beautiful they were on the outside and on the inside as I spoke to them. But I wanted to do more. How do you change the world as a hairstylist? I mean, you can give someone a great haircut, but do you really change the world with a great haircut? Not really. So at the time, interestingly enough, my husband and I had applied for immigration to Canada and it came through really, really soon. So overnight our lives turned upside down because we had to make this immense decision to leave our businesses and leave our established life and move to another country. We decided to take the plunge and we went with our children and overnight we were unemployed in sub-zero temperatures. Anyone who goes to Canada is given one piece of advice. All of your aging uncles and aunties will tell you, apply for a government job. Canadian government jobs are the way to go. I took their advice, even though I scoffed at it at the back of my mind. How would me, a hairstylist, find a government job in Canada? It didn't make any sense. But I thought might as well. Let me try. So I logged onto the website and lo and behold, there's a job posting for a hairdresser. And as I look deeper, it's for a hairdresser at a correctional facility, a medium to maximum security correctional facility. So I thought, hey, what do I have to lose? Maybe this is my calling. And I apply 
And a few months later, I secured that position and it blew my mind. I didn't know what to do. So I finally went ahead with it. And imagine me, a brown girl of less than average stature, walking in to a correctional facility, medium to maximum security. This means that it houses some of the most heinous criminals as we know them today. And of course, it was an institution for women, so that took a little bit of the edge off, but still, I was scared. But you know what? When I walked into that institution on the very first day, I knew, I just knew that my fears were unfounded. Working in the correctional facility is something that changed my life. Before I started working at the facility, I was given a very intense training process. Now during this training process, you're taught self-defense and you're taught theoretical things. You're taught how to decipher code or break up a fight and you know, many housekeeping things. But the one thing that they teach you that really sticks with you is that you are not in the institution to judge. You know, we as women, I feel sometimes even more than men, I hate to say it, we are extremely judgmental. We judge people based on their height, their color, their clothes, their accent, their friends, their schooling, you name it, we judge them. And when I walked into that institution, I too was guilty of this. I walked in thinking, I am better. I'm better than them. That's why I am here to teach them. And boy, was I wrong. I walked into that institution as a teacher and I stayed there, I feel, as a student. I learned more from those women than I could possibly teach them. So my actual job, I'm sure you're wondering what it was, my actual job at the institution was to teach women the art of hairdressing. In Canada, hairdressing is a regulated profession, which means that they have to sit an exam or work a, a couple of hundred apprenticeship hours before they pass this exam or go to hair college. So it's a very complicated process. So it was my job to go there and teach them the theory of hairdressing, which is textbook, and then practical skills so that they could sit and pass the exam or they could go on to hair school. So I walk in and there I am with a pair of scissors, me, <laughs> surrounded by all of these inmates who I would work with in, pair, in groups of six. So I would call them down and there would be three inmates who worked as the hairstylists and three inmates who worked as their clients. So the clients would sit in their chairs and the hairstylist would stand behind them and I would stand behind the hairstylist. And then I taught. I taught them to cut. I taught them to color. They taught me to love. They taught me to be generous. They taught me to have empathy. So you see a very interesting thing happened, much like when I was training and I came into this power flux and this conundrum of being vulnerable and being powerful based on the hairdresser's chair. The exact same thing happened when I was in the situation teaching. The inmates who were sitting in the chair as a client, it didn't matter how awful their crime had been, how hard their lives had been, what a strong facade they put on when they were in their cells or when they were in the institution. The minute they sat in that chair, they were vulnerable. I heard them tell stories. I heard grief. I heard remorse. And I saw something amazing. I saw the women who were in the position of being the hairstylist taking it upon themselves to counsel them, to help them, to listen to their stories and help them feel beautiful on the inside as well as on the outside. It was the most incredible thing and I will never ever forget it. I learned another thing from them, incredible generosity. You know, these women, they had nothing. A woman comes into prison with nothing and she leaves with nothing. But when they see other women around them, they want to do something to help if the other woman is in need. So if another woman was crying because she lost a parole hearing or one was crying because she missed her children, I would see some of the most hardened women 
the most hardened criminals come to them with a packet of sugar or a packet of ketchup or peanut butter that they have, had saved from their meal trays and give it to them as a gift because that was all they had. But they gave it with so much love and so much generosity that it really, really touched me and it really changed me. I had many other such instances and I saw great inventions and amazing uh, use of the human mind where women would curl their hair with tampons and they would make cake out of layers and layers of cookie and jam. It was just amazing and I will never forget this incredible experience I had at the institution and I'm so grateful for it. It taught me that I was brought here to teach and I was brought here to make a change and it gave me that opportunity it gave me a platform and i feel like maybe that was my calling maybe those four years that i spent there was why i am here i came back to pakistan a few months ago i came back to take care of aging parents and i was heartbroken to leave my job but when i came back i realized that women here they need help as much as anyone else Women here need to be uplifted. We have illiteracy, we have immense poverty, and we have women who are so disenfranchised, who are living amongst us. I want to set up a program, which I have through a YouTube channel, because I realize that the one thing that all women have here, at least most of them, is a mobile phone. They may not have basic education, so I can't teach them the theory, so clearly or in a school setting and there are so many women and there's just one of me. So I set up a YouTube channel where I teach women hands-on skills where they can learn to do hair, to color hair and the theory of hair in Urdu so that this can uplift them. Because the moment I empower a woman, the moment I teach her a skill, she has the ability to earn an income and the minute she earns an income, she's financially independent. When she's financially independent, she can use that money any way she pleases. And it's most likely she'll use it to feed her children better and to educate them and to lift herself out of the dire circumstances that she's in. And then we have a cycle of good. We as women need to empower other women. We don't need to bring them down. They're downtrodden enough. We don't need to judge them. We need to help them. And I firmly believe this. I believe that my video of me braiding someone's hair may help another little girl who's braiding her mother's hair at home as she watches a Pakistani drama think, hey, I could do this. I could be a hairdresser and I could make a life for myself. I just hope that I'm able to make that change and I'm able to do what I came here to do. Thank you for listening to my story and have a wonderful day.